This is a 1993 AutoZam AZ-1. Uh, it's great. AutoZam was a sub-brand of Mazda that they used to sell various small, mostly K cars under. This is the most famous AutoZam, but that's not what it's called. It's called an AZ-1. Although these days people preface this by saying it's a Mazda AutoZam AZ-1, as AutoZam is not a brand anymore, um, at least in use by Mazda. So um, these are really popular in the United States now because they're legal, and uh, Jay Leno did a video on them, and they're one of those cars that's very easy to just be like, whoa, it's so weird, look how crazy it is, and then just be done with it. Uh, I don't really want to do that too much, although I'm going to because you can't avoid it, but I wanted to talk about what it's like to live with one of these as your actual car. So I've had this one for probably about two months now, uh, and I have been daily driving it. I just want to give an overview of what that's like, because while these are super awesome and really cool and everything, um, maybe you want to know if it can actually fit as an actual car instead of just a thing that sits in the garage. So as far as a history of AutoZam, real quick, um, in the late 80s, Japan was a big time and had a lot of money and was a big player on the economic, world economic market. And everybody was like, oh, Japan's so great, so awesome. And then in the early 90s, that asset bubble, real estate asset bubble, really similar to the one that we also had in 2008, happened to Japan. And because of that, they're still recovering. But a product of that excess Gives birth, gives birth to lots of things. Um, in Japan's case, the AZ-1 is probably my favorite uh, symptom, I guess, of that era. So this is a K car, which means it is the same as the K trucks and K vans, Honda Actis, Super Sambars, the little commercial vehicles that drive around Japan that are really tiny. K class, and this is that. Uh, at the time, this had two other competitors, which is the Suzuki Cappuccino and the Honda Beat, and then this, the AutoZam AZ-1, and they formed what people call the ABCs of the K-car, sport car uh, pantheon, I guess. The It's less of a difference, I guess, between the Cappuccino and the AZ-1 because... While this is a Mazda or an AutoZam, technically, it's really a Suzuki. Uh, Mazda designed it, apparently based off of old concepts that Suzuki had going around, and then they elected to go with Cappuccino. Mazda took over the project, sent it to the UK for some reason, and designed it there. This was only, only, this was only effort, uh, <laughs> let me start over. This was only offered for sale in Japan. Never sold outside of there. So it's extremely JDM. Um, but yeah, so with the three ABCs of sports cars, this is the most flashy, the Beat is the least expensive and arguably the most comfortable, and the Cappuccino is usually rated as the best overall car to live with. Because while it has the same power plant as this, makes around the same power, might be even a little faster, is rear wheel drive, it's front-engined, and it's a convertible, and with normal doors. The Honda Beat is mid-engined, non-turbocharged, with normal doors. And then this is the pinnacle, at least as far as style and design goes, of that group. The uh, AZ-1 is also the rarest of them all, as, as I said earlier, I think, maybe. Um, this was designed when the economy was booming, and then it went, on for, went for sale right as the economy had tanked. So there's only a total of about 4,500 of these, and that's including the Suzuki Kara, which is the Suzuki branded version of this. When this went on sale, it costs about as much as what we would call a Mazda Miata, and this is a hard sell when you're looking at a car. I mean, people make jokes about, ah, ha, ha, Miata, you can't drive that as your only car, it's too tiny. No, this is on a whole nother level. That thing's practically a box truck compared to this. Uh, so that's essentially the story of the AZ-1. Um, and then because they were seen as nothing special, at least initially, a lot of them fell into the hands of people that didn't take care of them. And so there's a lot of roached ones out there, if they've survived. 
I don't know how many are left. Um, the price has gone up significantly since they became U.S. legal because we love these things, and there's a lot of people that want them, and there's not enough of them to go around. And then, you know, I mentioned Jay Leno video and everything about them. People are doing all sorts of YouTube things about this because, well, it's an easy way to generate content, I guess. Anyway, so this specific AZ-1, it's a 1993, although it was manufactured in 1992, and you'll find that most of them were made early on, and then they just kind of sat around. So this has a manufactured day of, was it like late 1982, like October or something like that? It's among the first run. But it was sold as a 93 because that's when it was first registered because it took that long for it to get into the hands of somebody. Um, this one is all original with the exception of the wheels. They're just some BF Goodrich aftermarket something and they were silver and I powder coated them white because it looks a lot better. Although they are dirty because I drive this. So hmm, it's not pristine right now. Uh, the stereo has been replaced, or the head unit, I should say. The speaker system has been replaced with a component speaker system. So it has tweeters on the dashboard and then um, just low end, or no, low range, I guess, speakers in the sills. So the stereo is pretty nice. Um, other than that, it's all original. Hasn't been messed with, doesn't have any holes in the dashboard. The engine hasn't been tweaked. It's got the original intake, uh, exhaust blow off valve and it's really nice um, specific to this one it has been repainted or resprayed in the past so with these when you got them they were either red or blue and they all had this silver bottom so if you got a red one red silver red interior blue you got blue top bottom gray interior and blue interior or at least blue seat inserts um, this one has been resprayed, and they originally came with single stage paint, which means it oxidizes and gets really shitty, but you just run it over with rubbing compound, um, like a buffing wheel, you know, cut and polish it, and the shine will come right back, and it's wonderful. However, this person who had this decided to either clear coat it or repaint it red. I'm not quite sure, and I'll show you what I mean. And it looks good from back here, and you probably can't see any of the flaws and everything. And it shows really well, and people don't notice these details, but I do. Um, because they did this, you can't repair this paint like you would normally because there's a coating on it now. So I can't fix these flaws without getting it completely, completely repainted. So I don't know if you can see it. I'll try to swing the light around to maybe you can see it. But there's a section here that runs along the top of this fender. This in the center is the original paint. This on the outer side is either clear or paint. And I can't determine it because when you go over it, it just kind of flakes off, but it's not necessarily red in color. It's kind of pink. So I can't tell if they just clear coated the original paint or if they repainted it. But they did a piss poor job and they didn't prep. So this peels right here. Cutting it down and not grinding it, but buffing it and using compound gets rid of it and most people don't notice it but it's there um, and they also elected to put a sticker right here I don't know if you'll be able to see it but before the top coat was dry or cured or whatever they slapped a sticker on it so now I have this outline and you can barely feel it and I've tried getting rid of it with compounds and stuff and there's just no way um, but it's a Neon Genesis Evangelion sticker from what I can tell nerve it says this, and then it has the logo thing, and then it says, uh, God's in his heaven. And all is right with the world, and all is right with the world. Whatever. Anyway, um, it's hard to see, but the sun catches it. And then, of course, when they went to sell it to take this off, they actually went with an object to try to scrape the sticker off, which is just fucking ridiculous. So, there's that. Um, here's the AutoZam logo. It's just these three little uh, guys that look like they want to snag on something with the blue and the red, which is cool. Uh, the original front hood here. You'll notice it's an offset scoop, and it looks really aggressive, and it looks really sporty. This just feeds the HVAC system. 
But I appreciate the offset nature anyway, because asymmetry in that way is pretty neat. The original concept had pop-up headlights, but they elected to just go with fixed-in-place lights, uh, which are just kind of these round oblong things, which is cool. Notice that it has one big wiper instead of two. I believe in the US anyway, this is a 24 inch wiper. Just standard, you can buy that wherever you want. And yeah, so you just got one. Uh, the other part about this car is it's not unibody or body on frame, it's a steel monocoque. So you can take all the body panels off, I take all the glass off too if you really wanted to. Um, and it would still be full, fully drivable and wouldn't flex or anything because the body panels don't provide any sort of structural support whatsoever. Maybe the doors when they're shut, but these are just fiberglass panels bolted on. So repainting is relatively easy because you can just pull all the panels off, hand them to whoever you want to paint it, and then they'll do it. Um, the mirrors here, I'm not quite sure, but I'm fairly certain that these are supposed to be black when they came from the factory. They elected to paint them. It doesn't look like it's the same paint they used to repaint this or clear coat, but they did, again, a piss poor job. You can see they didn't mask off the rubber here, and it just looks bad because the paint fades. Um, we'll get to the doors in a second, and if you know about AZ1s, then, well, you already know about that part. But you notice the, the glass here. There's a lot of glass. You have a top panel, you have an interior panel, which is essentially a sunshade used to block the sun. Um, this panel of glass, this panel of glass, and then this is your roll down window. It's just a little ticket sort of window, and that's all you get. Another panel back here, which is see through, and then the rear panel back here. Um, you do have functional side strakes here. This one is just a general airflow that goes through vent and your fuel filler cap and I believe this is probably like a seven gallon tank it's real tiny back here more functional just airflow sort of vents uh, around lights which I think looks fantastic I think the rear is probably the best part of the car your AZ1 label which is just a decal that's stuck there and then down here you'll see this metal panel that has AutoZam, which is cut out, and that's the actual font used for the logo, so it actually makes it pretty neat that they just use it as a, well, just a metal panel. I mentioned the original exhaust already. And these are the original size wheels. They're 13s, I believe. Um, just some sort of alloy things, whatever. And these tires are slightly wider than would be factory because I'm in the U.S. and I'd take what I could get. Um, but it's nice. This side strake over here is where the intercooler sits, and it's also the air intake for the engine. It'll go through, and then the intake sits right here. I'll pop the hood here in a moment, and that's how it feeds. And these are just general vents that flow cool air through. Um, so yeah, and you got a big RC-looking floppy antenna that if you move just a little bit, you get the bounce. And, uh, yeah, I think it's a great looking car. It looks pretty modern. Like, there's nothing that really dates it. It kind of sits on by itself. And when you tell people, oh, this is a 92 or a 93, they're somewhat surprised. But then again, people are just in awe about this car when they see it driving around. Until you get to stop, and then they freak all the way out again. So, here, I'll show you. So, of course, it can't just be a cute little car. Oh, and I should go over how this is laid out. So this is a rear-wheel drive, turbo intercooled, three-cylinder, mid-engined sports car. So the engine's not up front. It's in front of the rear wheels here in the back. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really awesome. And then they gave it gullwing doors because of course they did so as i was saying you drive around everybody goes oh what is that because it's really tiny and it's really small and it looks really cool and then if you stop like at a gas station or something and then you get out and then people freak out all over again because the doors look at them oh my god it's like a delorean and that's fine i mean if you're going to have one of these you have to expect to get a ton of attention all the time so that's just 
a part of the contract that you sign when you buy one and drive it around. Um, so, the doors, that's how it looks. Few things will get as much attention, say, at a Cars and Coffee, than an AZ-1. Uh, your competition, I guess, really boils down to if a DeLorean shows up, then you'll compete with them. But otherwise, you'll be king. King of the show, probably. I guess it depends on the group. Anyway, um, because the doors are going, which that's why you only get this tiny, tiny ticket window, because these panels are part of the door. And if you're a sort of person like me that likes airflow, uh, this is a terrible car for you in that when I'm driving around, especially now here in Florida anyway, the weather's cooling off so you can have your windows open, these, you only have those two little side ticket windows and there's piss off airflow. So it does have air conditioning, which is fine, but if you like the wind in your hair and sort of thing, this is a terrible car for it. You'd be better served by a Beat or a Cappuccino. Um, all right, so let's go to the interior. Specific to this car, again, it's all original. Uh, original steering wheel, original seats, shift boot, um, no boost gauges or anything stuck anywhere. But the most important part of this versus all other easy ones that I've seen is this part right here, this specific bolster. So normally when you see these, and I'm sure there's exceptions, it's just not common at all and I've never seen it, but I'm sure they're out there because here's one right here. Um, when you get in and out of this, at least when people in Japan had them, they just drag across this. You don't need to, but it's just what happens. So this bolster usually gets torn or at least worn down here and then this foam completely collapses. This one, however, is the original fabric and as far as I can tell, the original foam because it fits perfectly. So this driver's seat is in extremely good shape compared to most any other AZ ones I've seen. And you'll look at um, ones for sale and they'll just totally neglect to show this sometimes. Sometimes they're honest and they'll straight up show you, but they'll show you the passenger seat because that's always nice. But they never show this little bolster part, and that's the reason why. Uh, the seats themselves are a single piece of fibery, plasticky, I couldn't tell you the material, but this bucket is just one piece. So you have no adjustment this way. This is how your back and your ass are gonna be when you sit down, that's it. The driver's seat here does go forward and backwards. The passenger seat is bolted directly to the floor, so that seat doesn't move at all. But it is bolted as far back as it can go before you hit this little shelf back here, so you get as much space as you can. Um, again, this is a red one, so these are red inserts. If this was a blue, originally blue anyway, these red bits would be blue. Uh, the interior would be identical otherwise, though. So this is the only interior color flourish for that. Original steering wheel, it's just a Momo style looking one. It isn't Momo, or at least it doesn't say it is. Um, inset AutoZam little horn logo. That's the only other place that you get the front logo, but this is the only place that says AutoZam in here. And then on the back, that punched out metal piece. Um, so yeah, it's cozy, but let's sit in it okay so getting in an az1 is relatively easy getting out there's no way to do it gracefully so that's just something you're gonna have to get used to i guess um and i'm wearing the gopro on my head so you won't be able to see this but you put this your left foot in here and then you slide around and then you drop into the seat and you won't put any wear on that bolster like that and uh i'm 510 and I weigh about 155 pounds to give you an idea of what this is like. Um, if you're six feet tall, you're at the absolute max of what can fit here, but it doesn't guarantee you're going to fit because if you're six feet tall and you have more legs than you have torso, you won't fit. If you have more torso than you have legs and you're about six feet, you'll probably fit, but you also have to be relatively narrow. Uh, these seats, there's give to them, but they're fairly snug. Perfect for somebody my size. Um, and you also can't wear big goofy like New Balance shoes or anything. You have to wear thin ones because the pedals are somewhat close together. But I've never had an issue. So we'll close the door. I'm gonna sit squat because otherwise the camera is just up. <laughs> 
in the ceiling and you can't see anything. So this Pacific AZ-1 has 68,889.3 kilometers on it, which is quite low considering how old this is. Um, that's pretty much in line with low mileage AZ-1s. And it's, it's comfortable in here. I mean, it doesn't feel claustrophobic or anything. It's snug, it's very snug. But I never feel cramped even when I'm driving with my wife. We're, we fit just fine in here. It gets a little crowded. We have a small dog and if we bring him with us and we're in this, then it's too much. Uh, you have your speedometer and then you have your tachometer which is right in front. The AZ-1 has a 9500 RPM from the factory anyway. Uh, there's no power up there, it just makes a lot of nice noise, but basically at about 6,000 RPM that's as much power as you're going to get, and then it just holds through to about 95. Fuel gauge, temperature gauge, um, and this is a three-cylinder engine, so you do get better fuel economy than you think with a turbocharged Gullwing Mini Exotic like this. However, people just straight up lie all the time about the fuel economy they get. People will say stuff like, oh, 40, 50 miles per gallon. Yeah, it's bullshit. Um, if you drive this like you're supposed to drive an AZ-1, which is, you know, ringing it out, boosting the turbo, having a bunch of fun, I average about 33 city. So it's pretty good, but it's not some sort of incredible whatever number. Uh, also, this takes premium, so... Not that it matters, it's a, like I said, a, like a, not even a seven gallon tank, so 16 bucks, at least in 2008 prices right now. Uh, standard pedal layout, you do have a dead pedal back here. So this center console like shrinks back because there's nothing back there and they put a dead pedal so your foot actually goes behind this. So if you're cruising around and you're not using your left foot for anything, they give you a dead pedal, which is really nice and I always appreciate. Otherwise, dead pedal over here, uh, clutch, brake, gas, just like you expect. Shift pattern's the same. One, two, three, four, five, and then reverse. Five speed manual. I do have to change out the transmission fluid because the gear shift is a little sticky, but it still shifts just fine. Uh, aftermarket head unit here. It's just a Pioneer Cairo Zera, which is a CD player, but it does have auxiliary input. Uh, sounds great. And then the little tweeters up here that were installed and then Low range I guess speakers and the sills down here, which are not on the doors because Well, you need your structure on the side. So you sit into this car HVAC stack I guess here vertical fan AC Whether you want circulation or fresh air Where you want your air and the temperature Cable driven, standard of the time. Uh, I do have my cigarette lighter, I think. Yeah, it's in here. Never smoked in, fully clean. Ashtray itself is also quite clean. I mean, there's, of course, no small smell or cigarette burns or anything either, so that would give it away. Um, the reason I lifted the seat up is because this is essentially your glove box because there's no glove compartment in here and there's no storage box with a door so the best you can get is just lifting up the seat and I've got the auxiliary cable and then way too many um, eye drops so yeah um, you have your rear defrost hazards view mirror tiny visors which do come in Handy, I guess. And then this panel, which here. And uh, like I had mentioned, there's no graceful way to get out of this. So you usually put your hand up here. This is steel, so you're not gonna bend anything. Then you take this hand and you put it right here. Press some lift, right foot out, and then you slide out. And because this top part's open, you get enough space to get out. So it's not cramped to get out, it's just weird. Uh, these panels. They're just fabric covered fiberboard. And then you can see you get a like a sort of sun visory perforation to help block direct sun, but you'll bake in here. This is essentially a big fish bowl. And if you're gonna have one of these, 
and it's sunny where you live, even with the AC, you're definitely going to want to get this tinted. Um, AZ1 sticker. Yeah, and this one's broken too, but it still works pretty well. Shove it in. And then you twist it. And then it stays put. Oh, sorry if that was in the way. Um, let's go to the passenger side. It's going to do the same as the driver's side. However, you do get a bit more space. Not a lot. Get in the same way. If you're familiar with uh, early Miatas, recognize this. Uh, I've never owned a Miata, but a lot of people, when they see this, go, oh, hey, it's a Mazda handle. So makes sense. It's a Mazda car. Um, I'm sitting lower than I normally would in order to not have the camera up there. So sorry about that. Um, over here, as far as just straight up sitting, it's... It's okay. You know, uh, you can have taller people than can drive sit over here. And it might be fine, but I think it's a little cramped. Driving, you don't notice it because you're busy, but if you're just sitting over here in the passenger side, it might be worse. I don't know. Dashboard's fairly deep. Windshield's pretty raked back. Um, here's your window wind up. It's this little tiny, little tiny guy. So yeah. talk about the rear shelf Oof. go to the driver's side for this um, so this is tiny and it's weird and it's small but it's still useful um, my wife and I don't have any kids so we can use this as a car so like if we're gonna go to the grocery store just a relatively close one um, you have this back shelf back here and it's a metal with fabric over the top and you can fit Oh, I'd say about three wide set, like setting them with ways, paper grocery bags back here. And it doesn't obscure your vision any more than this back panel does. And it's completely usable. I mean, it's, it's weird and quirky, but it's certainly usable. You have an internal trunk, I should say, for what you can expect out of something this big. Um, Here's the back plastic panel. This is just a fabric cover that sits. It's stapled and permanent, or meant to be permanent. But this is what the seat bucket is made out of. Get a tool kit. Um, I don't know if this one's complete. I don't think it is. But there's nothing special about it. There's no AutoZam logos. It doesn't say Mazda or AZ1 anywhere on it. They're just, they're just shitty tools. Even the bag doesn't say anything on it, unfortunately. And then I pulled them from this little bag, which is original of the car. Again, just a cheapy plastic vinyl thing. Not even vinyl, probably. But this is snaps back behind the driver's seat, and this is essentially your glove compartment. That carries important stuff like this. It's my registration. Looks like some sort of Mazda warranty card. Um, that might be newer, but it also might not be. I don't know, that looks a little new for a 93. Some various other information. I'm not quite sure what this this is. And then a copy of the original owner's manual, or at least an original owner's manual. It does have water damage, but it's perfectly legible. And this does have useful information like what sort of oil, how much, what, what temperatures, how to rotate your tires, which you'll notice front to back, front to back. Don't <laughs> don't roundly rotate them. A bunch of other information. You know, batteries, you know, typical stuff, but it's neat to see pictures of the AZ1 drawn in a very serious way when the car itself is inherently not serious. So I like that I got that. And you notice a divot back here. Um, the spare tire goes here. I took the, I have the spare tire, but I took it out because I'd rather have this shelf to actually use. So that's out. But I still have it, but that's normally what's it. You figured they'd put it up front, but they elected not to do that um, from what I can tell for crash safety reasons. However, 
this thing is a complete death trap and there's no way to escape that. So if you're worried about safety, unfortunately you cannot drive an AZ-1. Um, back here, you do get covers for these. So if you decide to take these out, you can put them in this fancy bag and keep them safe. Maybe when it cools off even more, but the sun is brutal here in Florida, so I will keep those sunshades up. And let's, fuel fillers on this side. Let's look at the hood and engine. All right, start with the hood. There's nothing up here, as you'll see. So you just have essentially a panel. Windshield washer fluid, portion of your air conditioner because the condenser and the radiator live up here. Your brake booster and brake fluid. Headlights, adjustable strut towers, uh, intake for the HVAC system, which is fed by that scoop, even though it's a little much. Um, I'm missing the jack, which would be right here, and I'm sure they took it out because, oh, weight savings or whatever. It's usually how they go. Underneath this cover, though, is the radiator and the condenser, and they're set at an angle with a puller fan on the back. And they travel all the way to the back of the car, which, granted, is nine feet, so not that big of a journey. Um, it is dirty up here. I don't really care. It's a car. I'm not meant to show this. The next person can do that if they so choose. I just wanted it to run well. Back here is the engine. And you can see how the body panels are affixed to the chassis itself. There are these big bolts that just kind of hold it on. Engine itself, three cylinder, 660 cc, electronic petrol injection, otherwise known as fuel injection, um, turbocharged, intercooled, blow off valve, all sorts of stuff. Sounds terrible at idle as most Suzuki three cylinders in K cars seem to. Sounds great under load. It's subjective, of course, too. I think they just sound rattly and nuts. Not that smooth when it's just idling. And Jimny's share the engine block, not the exact same engine. Those are single cam, these are twin cam. Um, among a bunch of other changes, but they just don't sound good at idle. Really not much you can do about it, I guess. Anyway, the engine itself, um, it's opposed this way. So you have one, two, three. The block itself is probably this big. Everything else is plumbing and mounting. Um, this is just a standard Suzuki car, just mounted in a different way. So it's completely reliable because it's based off of commercial vehicles, you know, like K vehicles are meant for work and this is tweaked over to make it a sports car. It's nice, it's not, you know, I'm not saying that it's not a performance or whatever, I'm just saying that it looks like a Ferrari but it doesn't run as expensive as a Ferrari does. Uh, the original intake, I've replaced the air filter. A lot of people will just stick a cone on filter and that's totally reasonable, especially because the filters themselves are pretty expensive to get over here. Not terrible, um, about $30, including shipping to get it here. It takes a while. So that part you do have to order specifically. Um, there's some people on the internet that have found different filters that you can cut to make work. Uh, I'm not gonna mess around with something like that. Uh, I did replace the fuel filter itself too. So the fuel filter is just an off-the-shelf CarQuest one from Advanced Auto that you can just go into the store and physically buy. I don't have the part number offhand, but there's nothing special about it. The oil filter, you can just also buy those off the shelf at Advanced Auto Parts or AutoZone or Napa or whatever. There's nothing special about it. So there's that, and typically most filters that you'll put on that aren't original are gonna be higher capacity, and more oil is always better. Total, I think this takes three quarts now, maybe not even, maybe like two and a half, 2.75 quarts of oil with that extra filter on it. I use Mobile One Synthetic because it's good oil and it's uh, on sale at Costco all the time. Battery, it's a 12 volt system, um, is essentially 
motorcycle battery. It's usually what you're going to shop for. Um, works great. It's your radiator overflow tank all the way back here on the opposite end of the car. The car runs cool and everything's great. Uh, alternator compressor is, I believe, on that side of the engine. And if you're going to work on it, um, and there's a bunch of vacuum tubes and things, and there's a Suzuki Kara AutoZam AZ1 owners group on Facebook, which is mostly comprised of people in the United States that have these. And they're invaluable for a bunch of information. Um, like when you buy one of these from Japan, what things should you do? And this ERG valve down here gets clogged, and there's a bypass that you want to do on your blow-off valve so it doesn't vent the pressure before you're ready. Um, like the certain sensors and what you should use, what they do, all that sort of stuff has been filled out or filled out, found out and shared among that group. And it's, again, like I said, just invaluable. You can go on from underneath it. You go in the top here and then I won't be able to show you because I have to pull the carpet out, but there's a panel right here. So we'll usually take the seats out, which is just four bolts. And, uh, I always take the other one out too, so I have the most room. Pull this fabric off, um, and I believe there's like six, maybe eight bolts, and then it's a metal panel, and then you can see the other side of the engine from over here. And you can get to the oil filter. I usually go underneath just because I don't want to get any oil in here. But you can get to other parts like the blow-off valve and the intercooler piping and all that sort of stuff. So you actually get a lot of room. More so than you'd think. Um... Yeah, I mean, that's kind of it. But yeah, for living with one of these, I think it's great. And a uh, ton of attention. Everybody will want to talk to you about it. If that's something you're not really into, then, well, tough luck if you're going to have one of these. I suppose you could just be a prick and blow everybody off, too, if you wanted. Um, another quirk about these, too, when you get them, is a lot of times these mirrors are really loose. And... There's a few different ways to get at it, but the easiest way I've found is to pull back this rubber. You can pull this back from here, and there's a bolt underneath that you need to tighten in order to stiffen this up. Because it'll just get loose and it'll start flopping around, or if it's really loose, the wind will just push it. So you're probably going to have to do that. Uh, the other thing about AZ1s are these door struts. I've had two of these so far. I've got another one that's all heavily modified and currently for sale if you're interested. Um, but that one was the same to where the door struts go bad. So there's two ways to do this. You could try to find original pressure variants because they don't make the original struts anymore. You can't get them. And even if you can, they're restricted in how they can be shipped because they're under pressure gas and all sorts of stuff. But you can get replacements made and you can order them and you can work up a mounting system if they don't fit properly and that's probably the best way to do it but it's a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of money or you can do what somebody found out on the internet uh ryan berg i believe he's the one he's got a blue autozam that's gorgeous figured out that you can use volkswagen phaeton trunk struts from 2004 to 2008 whenever they sold it so you can get yourself four struts Two for each door. Four ball mount studs that fit the original threads, so you don't have to make have, do not have to make any modifications whatsoever. For around eighty dollars off Amazon, and it takes I don't know four or five days, maybe a week to get here. Swap them out, and then now you have workable door struts. The difference, however, is in well here I'll sit down. Is in how they operate. So normally. If you have the original struts, push the door open, and then it grabs probably about right here, and then it'll keep opening. These ones aren't that strong, so they'll just sit. You have to get them up to a certain point, and then it'll take over. So if you care about getting it just right, you can get the correct struts and the correct pressure, um, or if it's good enough, for the doors, it's weird anyway, the car itself, so who cares? 80 bucks on Amazon to get you sorted right up. And you can always just go straight back and do the proper way if you'd like.
uh, door handles underneath, door locks on the sides here. There you go. Um, what else? Oh, these are glass, which is very nice, so they won't cloud up. Um, <laughs> I guess that's it from that sort of standpoint. They're really awesome. Um, it's not a car meant for everybody, but it's the perfect car for somebody. Um, I see myself selling this one. I tend to go through cars. I mean, do this as a business anyway, so, you know. But I do enjoy my time with it, and I imagine I'll miss it when it does, when I do go ahead and sell it to the next person. However, I suppose I could always just buy another one, so. Anyway. I'm going to take this for a ride. However, I can't wear this GoPro like I normally would. So I'm just going to have it mounted on the dashboard, which means I'm not going to talk. So let's go for a ride. All right. GoPros are going. Uh, but yeah, like I said earlier, um, normally I would have the GoPro on my head, but you can't see anything if I do that. So I have this one mounted over here, so you can just get an idea at least close to what it's like to drive. And then I got this one so you can see what I'm doing as far as the comfort goes for shifting and everything. And it will get sort of loud, so I'm not going to talk, which is probably better anyway, because I'll get to see what I have to say. Anyway, I'm just going to go for a drive. I don't know where we're going to go. I don't know what we're going to see. I'm sure it'll be pleasant, though. There's nothing stopping you from driving with the doors open, and for stuff like this, I usually 